thank you all for coming. We are um, really excited to have you all here. We have a great panel today called Contesting Freedom During the Civil War Era. We have three great papers and panelists. Um, I will introduce them all now, and then they will uh, present their papers. I will then, at the end, kind of give a comment as well as raise some questions. And we are um, open also to questions from the audience. Please feel free um, to put those either in the, in the chat or in the question and answer function on the Zoom webinar. And then I will field those for the participants and we will um, then uh, kind of have, hopefully have a great and lively conversation and discussion at the end. So uh, first off, we have, uh, we'll, we'll go in the order of the program. We have Kayvon Dixon. Uh, she comes to us from Danville, Illinois. She's a Ball State student and is a graduate of Danville High School. She is a senior at Ball State studying history with a minor in African-American studies. Uh, her areas of interest include the Civil War and Reconstruction Era, mass incarceration, Abraham Lincoln's uh, policies regarding African-Americans, African-American social justice movements, um, she is currently working on her senior research paper, which I assume this her paper today is related to, on how Lincoln's political past influenced the Emancipation Proclamation and hopes to provide a more realistic view of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, our second panelist is, um, and Jamie, I am Jamie Reeder, because I forgot to put your last name in there, is a history major with minors in religious studies and American sign language. Uh, he's a senior from West College Corner, Indiana. He enjoys studying American history, especially the Civil War era, uh, and has done, he's done a lot of or, uh, research on fraternal organizations, the lingering effects of slavery after the Civil War, and the effects film had on American psyche during the Cold War. Uh, this summer, he's interesting, uh, interning excuse me, at the Wayne County Historical Museum in Richmond, um, Indiana. And in the fall, he plans to attend graduate school here at Ball State. Um, and then finally, we have Dimitri Napoleon, who's currently a junior at Ball State as well, um, studying digital audio production and is minoring in journalistic storytelling and history. Um, he has a passion for history, but is also heavily involved with the student-run radio station, uh, WCRD 91.3, which is located on the, on the campus. Uh, the main goal that he's um, going to kind of point to in his article in the implications of guerrilla warfare on the Kansas-Missouri border um, today is to, to really think about uh, eyewitness accounts on the border with official government documents to create a holistic account on combat activities that are frequently left out of textbooks, um, which I think you know, uh, touches upon some of the things that were said in the, in the intro um, by Dr. Stephan and Dr. Johnson. Um, and uh, Dimitri also enjoys spending time with his friends and family and visiting museums. So I think all three of these papers are going to touch on a lot of the things that were raised of historical contingency, of contested ideas, of time and place, um, of how history is remembered um, and thought about. And so with that, I am going to turn it over to Kayvon for her paper, um, and uh, away we'll go. OK, please bear with me while I attempt to share my screen. Okay, is everybody able to see that? Great, okay, hello. My name is Kayvon Dixon and the paper that I will be presenting is titled, Who Feed the Slaves? An Examination of the Emancipation Proclamation. For this paper, I took a historiographical approach and chose to examine previous research done on this topic by historians. And by doing this, I was able to compare and contrast interpretations on my topic. <laughs> My overarching historiographical question that I researched was, how much credit can Lincoln be given for the freedom of African-Americans? With this question in mind, I found books written by historians that praised Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, as well as books that did the complete opposite. I would like to start by first providing some important historical background. In the year 1619, a ship docked in Jamestown, Virginia, this ship brought with it approximately 20 to 30 slaves. These slaves were the first of approximately 400,000 slaves that would eventually be brought to the United States. 
This singular event depicts how slavery has been rooted in American history since the very beginning. In 2019, the New York Times released a project developed by Nicole Hannah-Jones titled The 1619 Project. In this project, Jane Jones comments on how this ship landed, quote, just 12 years after the English settled Jamestown, Virginia, one year before the Puritans landed in Plymouth Rock, and some 157 years before the English colonists decided they wanted to form their own country, end quote. As our nation progresses, one thing seems to remain constant. African-Americans continue to be held as slaves. This is still the case during the Civil War in 1861, the same year Abraham Lincoln becomes president of the United States. During Lincoln's first administration, he released the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. This document is commonly credited for being the document responsible for freeing the slaves. However, two years later, the 13th Amendment is ratified on December 6th, 1865. This document is what finally formally puts an end to slavery in America. There are several common misconceptions linked to the Emancipation Proclamation. The first of these would be the nickname that Abraham Lincoln gained from the document. Lincoln became known as the Great Emancipator. With this nickname came the idea that Lincoln, as well as the proclamation, played a major role in freeing the slaves during the Civil War. Another misconception involves Lincoln's intentions. This raises the question on whether the Emancipation Proclamation was for the betterment of African Americans in bondage, or if instead the document was no more than an effort to save the Union. Many historians also view the credit given to Lincoln in the document as being a misconception. If one was to Google the question, who freed the slaves? To no surprise, the answer that would pop up would be Abraham Lincoln, and the document that would be credited is the Emancipation Proclamation. The historian Michael Vernberg is one person who criticizes Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation in his book, Final Freedom, the Civil War, the Abolition of Slavery, and the 13th Amendment. Vernberg starts his book on this topic by explicitly stating, quote, by itself, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free a single slave, end quote. The Emancipation Proclamation indeed did not free slaves in Union control. In fact, Lincoln deliberately left the states that were in the Union possession out of the document. This left approximately 800,000 slaves still in eternal bondage. Not only did Lincoln exclude states in the document, Fernberg also points out that he also allowed for a grace period for the rebel states to essentially avoid having to free the slaves. This grace period was mentioned in the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation that was released in 1862, exactly 100 days before the final version was released. Bernberg is quick to point out that this grace period gave rebels a set amount of time to get back into the Union. This alone can be taken as evidence that Lincoln was wholeheartedly more focused on the state of the Union than he was the lives of African Americans. Not only did the proclamation exclude some states, it also did not explicitly state that all slaves had to be freed immediately. Lincoln also avoided dealing with the future of those now freed African Americans and instead left that up to the states that were affected by the proclamation. He also avoided speaking on the future of still enslaved, of slaves still enslaved in the loyal states. As Vernberg points out, Lincoln believed that, quote, the future of the Union mattered more than the future of African Americans, end quote. Another form of criticism comes from Leonard L. Richards. Richards. In Richards' book, Who Freed the Slaves? The Fight Over the 13th Amendment, Richards decides to shift the credit from Lincoln to the Republican James Ashley, who was a congressman from Ohio and abolitionist during Lincoln's presidency. According to Richards, Ashley, quote, made no attempt to hide his radicalism. He made it clear that he would do almost anything to destroy slavery and the men who profited from it. End quote. Ashley has been credited as being a leading supporter who pushed for the 13th Amendment with the intent to better the future of African Americans and not to better the Union. Ashley made countless proposals that proposed not only the abolitionist agenda, but also for the disenfranchisement of previous slaveholders. <laughs> 
Some of the pushback against Lincoln as the hero comes from the knowledge of what Lincoln's initial plan was for ab abolishing slavery. Lincoln went through several different plans of action, one of which being compensating the slave owners as a meet of getting them to rejoin the Union. In April of 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the District of Columbia Compensated Emancipation Act, which freed the slaves in the, in the District of Columbia by paying the owners up to $300 for each slave they lost. Another part of Lincoln's initial plan was to ship former slaves out of the country. Richards explains that supporters of this plan believed that, quote, African colonization would rid the country of the poor and despised free Blacks, end quote. This plan did not aim to help the former slaves, but instead sent them away to deal with the problems that America had caused them. There is also a plethora of historians who praise Abraham Lincoln's efforts and who believe the Emancipation Proclamation was exactly what was needed at the time. Two of these historians are James J. Bumal and William A. Link. This praise can be found in the book, Rethinking American Emancipation, Legacies of Slavery and the Quest for Black Freedom. According to them, the proclamation allowed there to be a shift from ideals to actions. It is one thing to say that it's a call to support it. It is another to actually work to support that very cause. When looking at how things change, one cannot simply expect for individuals to enact change on their own without a government willing to back them. In order for there to be actual change, it was crucial for Lincoln to put his support down on paper and make his words law. Without actual support from the government, there would fail to be any actual development in the fight against slavery in the country. The proclamation, although it has its flaws, allowed for there to be official discussions on what to do about slavery. The proclamation was one of the main reasons talk of an abolition amendment advanced so much. There had to be some sort of push for a structural difference in the nation because as these two historians point out, quote, the legal abolition of slavery required structural change in the nation's laws. Individual slaves, for instance, could obtain freedom without changing a legal order that sanctioned slavery, end quote. Lincoln's background in law is also another reason why historians praise the Emancipation Proclamation so heavily. An example of this would be the book, Act of Justice, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and the Law of War, written by Burris M. Carnahan. If viewed from a legal lens, both the preparation and the proclamation itself can be seen as being works of art. This can be tied to how Lincoln used rights that the Confederates could not argue against in order to justify the document. Conahan points out said rights as being, quote, the right to seize and destroy enemy property for reasons of military necessity, and on the right to seek allies through promising liberty to an oppressed people, end quote. This caused Confederates to be forced to do one of two things. They could either allow the Union to free the slaves based on the idea that, of them being property, or they could admit that slaves were not property and therefore people deserving of rights. This showed that Lincoln was more than determined to find a way to free African-Americans that, that would not allow for any gaps legally. Lincoln also wanted to find a way to not only pronounce freedom for the slaves, but also aid the war efforts. The proclamation needed to accomplish both of these goals in some faction, which Carnahan believes it did. According to him, the proclamation successfully shifted the focus of the Civil War to also include the quest for freedom of the enslaved. This was no longer just a war about states' rights, but was now a war about slavery. Many African Americans do not view the Emancipation Proclamation as the end of slavery, as it was largely ignored in the rebel states. So many slaves were left unaware of their freedom. Instead, the proclamation could be viewed as the beginning of the end of slavery from a government standpoint. Today, rather than celebrating January 1st, the African-American community celebrates June 19th as the Day of Freedom. It was on this day that the Union Army led by General Gordon Granger arrived in Texas and issued Executive Order Number 3. Sadly, this took over two years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation for slaves to actually hear of their freedom. This can be seen as a testimony to both Lincoln's power and his faults. Lincoln did not force, enforce the Confederacy to enact the order, nor was the Confederacy willing to do so. However, without the Emancipation Proclamation, a legal fight against slavery would not have begun.
The credit Abraham Lincoln is given for the Emancipation Proclamation and how it played a major role in ending slavery has been a topic of debate against, amongst historians. Lincoln's efforts to combat slavery are viewed differently depending on whether the historian sees them as lacking or revolutionary. It is not entirely wrong to credit Lincoln, but with that credit, one must also bring criticism. The Emancipation Proclamation as an executive order was theoretically astounding, but when it came to putting it into action, Lincoln failed. On the other hand, James Ashley kept his ideals steady and used these ideals to continuously push for the freedom of African-Americans. With Ashley's help, the 13th Amendment succeeded in giving African-Americans in the United States a chance to move towards equality. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kayvon. That was great. Um, I, we now, I forgot to tell you all, I'm Dr. Felker Cantor <laughs> in the Ball State History Department. So, um, but it's really not about me. Um, so next up, we have Jamie Reeder. And so I'll, uh, I'll turn the table over to him. I think he's also going to try to share his screen. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can figure this out. Um, all righty, can everyone see that? Good. All righty. So hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie. Uh, I'm a senior this year, and my presentation is titled What Freedom Meant to Laboring Free People. So uh, this was a research project that I also did in Dr. Edgerton's class, uh, re and it, I researched the transition from slavery into freedom in Louisiana during and after the American Civil War, so from 1862 to 1867. Uh, so why is Louisiana of uh, any importance? Uh, Louisiana was captured early in the Civil War uh, towards the end of April to the beginning of May in 1862. Uh, this resulted in Louisiana becoming a testing ground for freed labor relations and early reconstruction policies. So this is really interesting because you're getting uh, tests of reconstruction policies before it's even sure that the Union's actually going to win the war. Uh, also, another point of note, uh, New Orleans was the largest economic center in the South, so it was very important that uh, the Union captured New Orleans. So we'll start off there with the capture of New Orleans. Uh, it was captured, uh, as I said, uh, April to May in 1862, and General Benjamin Butler was the man who took command uh, after the Union regained control, and you can see him pictured there on the right. Uh, he was one of he was more of a political general, so he was better and more focused at governing areas than actually fighting battles. Uh, as you can probably see from that image uh, with the mob, he ended up being very unpopular, so he was quickly relieved of power in just about uh, seven or eight months. But it's studying what he did is very important because he established the very first labor systems for African Americans in Louisiana. So we'll start off with uh, his labor relations. Uh, Butler wanted to keep former slaves on the plantations as much as possible. He thought that doing this would help maintain order in the newly captured territory, and he wouldn't have to deal with all the social upheaval that came with liberating slaves. Uh, he did this by offering them money in return for working the fields, and it ended up being a really big success. Uh, you can actually see in the excerpt on the top right there, that's a letter to Abraham Lincoln, where he talks about how some slaves were producing even more uh, sugar than they were before the union, union arrived there. Uh, but eventually, overwhelming numbers of slaves started fleeing from plantations, and Butler finally agreed to put them to some use. Uh, initially, he had been working in non-combative roles, such as building fortifications, which you can see in that image uh, in the bottom right. If you can read that blue writing, it's very crude language, but it's basically the African Americans offering their services to Butler so that uh, to build fortifications and trenches and stuff like that. Uh, but eventually Butler became desperate for more soldiers. So he was forced to accept the help of some already organized regiments of uh, African-Americans and they were called the Native Guard. Uh, and this is the start of an important trend uh, in the South. The work of African-Americans is controlled and regulated by the Union military and eventually it'll end up being uh, Union like government agencies. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Butler was relieved of power in December of 1862, and this guy, uh, Nathaniel Banks, took command. 
Uh, just a couple of weeks after he got there, he issued an order that was meant to regulate slave labor. So this order directed plantation owners to provide food, medication, clothing, quarters, education, and wages to their slaves. And uh, so this seems like to be like a huge step forward for uh, laboring African Americans in Louisiana, having all these guarantees to them. And just to make it even better, 99% of the wages that were supposed to be earned by slaves in 1864 were paid to them. So you would probably think that the planters would just refuse to pay uh, the people they still see as slaves wages, but uh, they actually end up doing it. But unfortunately, uh, this is all gonna be taken back. We're taking five steps forward with these uh, new policies, but we're just gonna end up taking four steps backwards uh, and we'll start to get that here next. So there were some major failures with this. Uh, African-Americans simply did not want to work in the same way that they had in the past. They wanted like a really big change in the labor system, not just a slight variation of what they've lived with. Uh, sometimes slaves would refuse to work. And when they did this, uh, they would still get their wages often, but they would just be lowered or they could just be sent to labor on the public works where they didn't earn any money. Uh, and to, in order to obtain work in the fields, which was the only skill that most of the slaves had, they were required to sign one-year contracts with the heads of the plantation. So slaves were, of course, were pressured into signing these contracts or else they wouldn't have any work at all. And uh, another thing that uh, a lot of people don't often think about is that a lot of these people, the slaves were unable to read or write. So they didn't, there was a chance that they could be signing themselves into something that they really didn't want. Uh, so you would have a lot of union agents come down and explain to slaves the contracts they were signing. So of course, uh, they're being chained to the plantation for a year. And this is a start of another trend uh, with people in Louisiana trying to just recreate that pre-Civil War society, the society that they wanted before the union showed up. So the next major thing that happens in Louisiana is the Constitution of 1864. Uh, Louisiana was required to draft a new constitution to be readmitted to the union. And this seems to be another huge step forward for uh, laboring slaves in, in Louisiana. Uh, this constitution legally ended slavery in the state of Louisiana, as you can see in the top excerpt, and it also established a nine hour workday and instituted a minimum wage. So this seems to be really big. All of a sudden slavery is no more and we're seeing uh, labor uh, rules that are kind of familiar to what we have today. But again, this hopes of some sort of uh, labor equality is going to again be stripped away, but it's gonna be stripped away by state legislators. And they're gonna do that by drafting black codes. So black codes were drafted to keep the freed people in a condition that was indistinguishable from slavery. Uh, the Louisiana state government drafted uh, the first black code in their state soon after the ratification of their new constitution. So Louisiana had this statewide black code and then different uh, localities in uh, Louisiana could build on that and put in even stricter black codes if they wanted to. So the statewide black code prevented African-Americans from getting work outside of the agricultural sector. Again, trying to keep uh, African-Americans in the fields doing the labor that they were doing uh, before the union showed up. It also expanded vagrancy laws, which essentially are just laws that punish those who were homeless or without means but it provided a loophole that white people were able to exploit. So they didn't have to say, face the same consequences that uh, free people did. Uh, some parishes went even further with their black codes. And a really good example of this is the parish of St. Landry. And you can see three of the four or three of the nine sections of uh, their black code over there on the right. So the first one essentially regulates uh, where a free person can go. So that's, giving the control of where they can go to their employer. Uh, and then the second one, it essentially establishes a curfew for freed people, but you can also leave there if they have the permission from their employer again. And then this third one is uh, probably the most blatant. Uh, every freed person was required to be in the regular service of a white person or a, former, or a former owner who's held responsible for their actions. So by, Drafting just these three, not to mention the other six that were present in their black code, you're basically legislating slavery. So uh, you're controlling where they can go, when they can go somewhere, 
and uh, what they can do and requiring them to be in a position that was essentially indistinguishable from slavery. So again, this is just reestablishing that pre-Civil War society that the uh, people of Louisiana wanted. So life in this new labor system, of course, free people felt just as threatened by planters as they were before the Civil War. Uh, an important primary source that I used in my paper is from Carl Schurz, who was a Union military commander who was sent by Andrew Johnson to survey the South after the, after the Civil War ended. And he had some really interesting things to say about Louisiana. He reported that planters were still threatening to shoot the free people who were contracted under them. So just like what was happening just a couple of years before the, before the Union showed up. Uh, in many cases, planters were not providing sufficient food or clothing to African Americans. So even the guarantees that were made uh, back two years before in 1863 under General Banks, uh, those aren't even being provided for even anymore. Uh, if a free person who was under contract tried to escape from their planter, uh, the community was compelled to return them. So that's just like drafting the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, which was a major piece of legislation that uh, was put in place before the Civil War to uh, keep to get free people who, uh, es who escaped to uh, be forced to come back to a plantation. So what you're essentially doing is switching out slave with free person and master with planter in this. And then the, this last example that uh, Schur has noted, which is uh, probably the most obvious attempt to reestablish uh, the civil war, the pre-civil war norms, were uh, instances of people still claiming African Americans as their property. So in July of 1865, uh, Edward Tully, who was a white man, sent this uh, young African American man named Calvin to their like uh, county clerk, and uh, sent him with a piece of paper that said that. Calvin was to be Edward's property until set free by Congress. So even after uh, the end of the Civil War, after drafting a new constitution that abolished slavery, uh, these people, individuals in Louisiana are still trying to recreate those norms of before the Civil War. So some other uh, general atrocities that took place uh, on plantations. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, which I'll talk about more in a second, has lists of individual atrocities that were committed by uh, planters against free people. And in between March of 1865 and February of 1867, there's more than a, a hundred of these uh, different atrocities taking place. So uh, do the math on that and that's like one a week or, or so. So just a ridiculous amount of these things. So in this first one, uh, a white planter is trying to get one of his freedmen who's contracted under him to whip another freedman. Of course, the first freedman refuses uh, and he gets shot. And then the white person goes ahead and whips the other um, free person anyways. In the second one, a freedman was uh, stabbed by an employer uh, without any provocation. And then in this third one, a uh, white planter felt threatened by a freed person who wasn't doing anything. And the planter went inside to his house, grabbed his gun, came out, and then shot the freed person. So of course, these are all atrocities with no provocation on the side of the freed people. But an important trend is that uh, all of them got away scot-free. Uh, no action was taken by the civil authorities. So now you're seeing all the different parts of uh, society who are trying to recreate those pre-Civil War norms. You're seeing the individual people like Edward Tully. You're seeing uh, the police officers and the judges like you see here state legislators and local legislators. Everyone's trying to uh, recreate that society. So just to talk a bit more about the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, it was established in March of 1865 in order to assist uh, former slaves uh, in the aftermath of the Civil War, especially in terms of gaining labor contracts for them. Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau acquired abandoned land, which it used to help alleviate the poverty of free people by granting land to those who applied for it. Because the idea here was that if people had private land, then they could have their own economic autonomy and make life for themselves and not have to depend on a white planter who had been abusing them for years. Uh, in the recorded applications for land, we can see that most people who applied for land were free people with little to no means, just like in this example down here. So you can see it's usually a freedman applying for it. Uh, 
and they have probably a wife and a couple of children, they ask for a couple of dozen acres and they don't have any means. So they don't have any assets or any to them, anything to their name. They're just going to go and try to make the best for themselves on this uh, land. Uh, but this would be another case where it seems to be a huge step forward, but we're just ended up going backwards because the Freedmen's Bureau is also going to fail by 1869 due to a number of issues, including uh, fin financial reasons and extreme unpopularity by uh, white people, especially in Louisiana. So just some uh, important takeaways from this presentation. Uh, the Union military and government agencies uh, became responsible for alleviating the plight of laboring African Americans throughout and after uh, the Civil War, and uh, especially into Reconstruction. Uh, hopes of slaves and eventually free people are repeatedly dashed by those in power in every level and section of society, especially in government. So you have this in state legislators, local legislators, and civil authorities, in communities who felt uh, compelled to return uh, free people who had escaped, and individuals like people like Edward Tully who uh, just want to own slaves like they did a couple years before the uh, union showed up. And so, as I said, these individuals and communities all have a desire to return to some sort of pre-Civil War slave society. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, the Civil War marked an undeniably important shift in racial relations in the United States. Uh, but that does not mean that issues with labor inequality were fixed or even significantly altered uh, during and after the Civil War. And I always like to uh, ask myself, like, why is this important to know uh, at all. Well, understanding the first labor relationships of uh, African Americans that developed during and after the Civil War in Louisiana uh, can help us understand how the entire South, not just the uh, labor sector of the South, uh, transitioned itself into a non-slave society. So thank you guys all for listening. All right, awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Well done, um, really nicely done. Um, now we will move on to our final panelist, Dimitri. Um, I do not believe that he's gonna be screen sharing, but we'll give him the, the floor here. Um, I think he's unmuted himself. So we will go from there. Um, great work, everyone, so far. I'm actually, I'm gonna go ahead and screen share my paper so everyone can re uh, follow along with me. Uh, so. <clears throat> All right, so can everyone see my screen? Awesome. So my paper is about the implications of guerrilla warfare on the Kansas, Missouri border. Um, talking about something that not a lot of historians uh, really, or a lot of education uh, majors or anything that's in college or in high school is really covered. So without further ado, I'm just going to get right into it. So Quote, guerrilla struggle, perhaps the most prevalent form of war in history, is also the most devastating challenge to any notion of civility or virtue in war. In this sense, guerrilla war approaches total war, the war of all against all, said Michael Philman, author of Inside War. For the families on the Kansas-Missouri border who experienced the sense of total war during the Civil War, it meant constant insecurity. It meant fear of sudden raids from bushwhackers, jayhawkers, and local militia alike. It stripped away Southern chivalry and revealed the brutality of war underneath. Guerrilla combat also reflected state and political issues as well, especially magnified within the border. Therefore, I strongly believe that guerrilla warfare had governmental, military, and social impacts that are often glossed over during civil war discourse. For being considered a sideshow of the guerrilla, uh, sideshow of the Civil War, guerrilla warfare caused considerable controversy in the United States and the Confederate States alike. Both governments were incredibly conflicted. Most politicians believe that this type of warfare was dishonorable, and the wild nature of the fighting had deeply disturbed officials. Both sides attempted to define what guerrilla warfare was and attempted to control its scope across across the nation. The issue of definition became a difficult one. Who was a raider, partisan, bushwhacker, guerrilla, or jayhawker? To add uniformity to federal action against guerrillas, the War Department issued General Order Number 100 on April 24th, 1863. The document spells, spells out what it means to conduct war and defines martial law. 
More importantly, it lays out how Union soldiers should treat independent fighters. Partisan Rangers, guerrilla fighters, with some connection to the Confederate Army who are in uniform were to be treated like any other prisoner of war. For those that were not in the Confederate garb, they were, quote, not entitled to the privileges of prisoners of war, but shall be treated summarily as highway robbers or pirates. Citizens who choose to aid the enemy could be deemed, quote, war traitors, which could result in a death sentence. President Abraham Lincoln had different feelings towards guerrilla combat in Missouri. In a letter issued to Governor Thomas C. Fletcher, Lincoln urges Missourians to, quote, reach within themselves and come with a peaceful solution to the violent acts committed. He proposed local leaders create town halls with a peaceful solution to the violent acts committed. He proposed that, that they create town halls to discuss, quote, mutual security in the future. This included a pledge to cease harassment of fellow citizens and to crack down on those who chooses to continue to incite violence. However, reality was much harsher in the year leading up to Lincoln's letter to Fletcher. Carrying out peaceful military relations with citizens while also dealing with increased guerrilla presence blurred the lines of ethics for commanders in the field. Guerrillas were incredibly difficult to find as many looked and behaved like regular citizens. This caused many army officers to increase indiscriminate executions of alleged guerrillas. Innocent, innocent civilians could be executed without the opportunity to defend themselves in court. The Confederate Army faced similar issues of distrust towards guerrilla tactics. The Confederate Army had benefited greatly from the practice, however, because guerrillas were able to cause havoc in areas that were controlled by Union troops. So the government had decided in late April of 1862 that they should attempt to take advantage of the situation via the passage of the Parson Ranger Act. At opposed to being referred to as guerrillas, these, quote, rangers were official Confederate troops dispatched to participate in guerrilla tactics. They enjoyed many benefits like provisions and rations. The Parson Ranger Act tried to regulate guerrilla warfare and limit the independent nature of the fighting. This plan was quickly criticized from a variety of sources. Feldman believed that the option to defer out of the regular army how it had hurt the power of conscription and drafting, and the morale of Confederate soldiers had been damaged as well. He cites letters that state that military guerrillas were often too expensive for what they offered, service as couriers and pickets. Another problem that arose from their was their independent nature. Many took advantage of loose requirements to behave no differently than a raider, causing panic across the countryside. Thomas C. Reynolds, Missouri's Confederate governor paints a picture of a people burdened in a letter to the Confederate Secretary of War. His citizens were not only, quote, writhing under the yoke of and oppression of the enemy, but had to contend with, quote, acts of unprecedented oppression and barbarity. In other words, Missourians dealt with potential Union incursions along the, along the quick raids from bands, uh, had to deal with potential Union incursions along with quick raids from bands of guerrillas. He proposed a two-part solution, upgraded military personnel within the Missouri borders, or to have Confederate President Davis publicly disavow guerrilla warfare. Guerrilla warfare in Missouri had roots in the pre-war period. Since 1855, Missourians had made incursions into Kansas territory leading to fighting between free state and pro-slavery men. The, na the National Civil War became the opportunity for Kansans to get their revenge. By 1861, Missouri and Kansas were in the midst of a showdown. Eventually, one would have to give. And that day came on May 10th, when Union General Nathaniel Loyne sent Army troops and home guards to break up an encampment named Camp Jackson at Saint Lu in St. Louis after discovering the secessionist Governor Claiborne Jackson received military weapons from the Confederate Army. Upon arrival, riots and chaos ensued. Jackson, who fled from the state capital, formed a large state militia called the Missouri State Guard and gave command to Sterling Price. This decision enraged the governor of Kansas, Charles Robinson, who declared that it meant war, giving rise to prominent Jayhawkers, Charles Jennison and James Montgomery. These men, along with Senator Jim Lane, 
would lead the charge for the stereotypical Kansas gorilla, the Jayhawker. The Camp Jackson affair gave the Jayhawkers the incentive to punish Missourians for their incursions during the bleeding Kansas era that ended just a few years prior. The following raids by the, quote, Kansas Brigade had a variety of implications and consequences. And these raids occurred early in the war and much of the national focus was on preserving the Union. Slavery was not on the forefront of generals' minds during this time period. So, however, for African-Americans in Missouri, Kansas militias and guerrillas meant new roles. In Jim Lane's brigade, many had joined the ranks as teamsters, cooks, and even some soldiers. Lane, who also was a U.S. Senator, had hoped that recent events would send a message to the federal government. In a speech during the first session of the 37th Congress, Lane had stated that the institution of slavery would not survive, quote, the march of the Union armies. It was clear that he meant his personal guerrilla band had shown that the Union army had the capability to crush slavery if it so desired. Many of the enslaved populace flocked to the Kansas brigades, and James Montgomery said in a letter that, quote, contraband brigades are coming up, are coming in hourly, and wondered what to do with them. Whether these Jayhawkers truly believed in abolitionism or not had little consequence. Missourians lost, quote, property to their sworn enemy, and these recently escaped African Americans had the potential to carve out a new life in a new free in a free state. Whether or not they achieved this is another matter. The Jayhawkers may have been the original guerrillas on the border, but the most notorious were Missourians under William C. Quantrill. On August 21st, 1863, William C. Quantrill and his raiders stormed into the abolition center of Kansas, Lawrence. What, re what resulted was pandemonium. Sophia Bissell, a local Lawrence resident, described what she saw in a letter to a cousin, quote, and oh, to hear the yells and hear the firing and to see the people running black and white, old and young, and the fiends chasing them after them, firing as fast as they could, end quote. One gorilla even threatened the family if they had become unionists that they would have been shot. After staying outside, she saw that many of the buildings owned by family and friends had been set on fire already. By the end of the day, the Bissell family faced thousands of dollars in damages. Sidney Clark's experience during the, uh, during the raid offers a unique experience as a target for the raiders due to his involvement with the Republican Party. Clark was forced to hide in the cornfields while he watched, quote, 150 of my neighbors and friends murdered with a fiendish brutality without parallel in the history of civilized warfare. Chaplain H.D. Fisher cited two primary reasons for the raid. The first was the lack of a city defense. Most of, the, most of those that could defend the city were all fighting in the war away from Kansas. Most that, that were still in the city had grown complacent due to the numerous false alarms. Secondly, the method of attack was easy for invasion. Fisher had believed that the extensive spy network within the city limits and intelligence for Quantrill on the weak points of the city helped target locations. The raid was a perfect example of the deadly nature of guerrilla warfare. In traditional combat, the fighting was done between soldiers and generals in complicated battle formations. Within this fighting, nobody was safe. Citizens in the border towns faced constant fear of being victim to the decisions of other guerrillas. In this example, citizens of Lawrence had to pay for the actions of Jayhawkers, the guerrillas from Kansas. In this sense, guerrilla warfare became what is commonly referred to as a people's war. It represented ideologies of guerrillas, a sense of justice and revenge controlled Quantrill's currency, a currency that was played through blood and property. The actions of Quantrill's raiders factored into one of the most controversial decisions of the Civil War, Thomas Ewing's Jr.'s Order No. 11. Before analyzing the impact of the order, it is important to understand the context. Historian Albert Castell explains that, quote, the efforts of the federal army to put down bushwhacking was frustrated by the skill of the guerrillas, the difficult nature of the countryside, and above all, the assistance rendered the bushwhackers by the civilian population. Most of the people on the western of the western Missouri looked upon the guerrillas as their avengers and defenders, and a large portion of them had friends and kinsmen riding with Quantrill. Consequently, the aid, they aided them in every possible way, from feeding and sheltering 
them to smuggling and them ammunition and acting as spies. Even anti-Confederates insisted the partisans out of fear of reprisals. Thus, in effect, the federal forces in Western Missouri were opposed by an entire people. In a letter to St. Louis, Ewing states that a situation that the situation is forced is, is faced with. And he points directly at the civilian population of Western Missouri as the source for the continued raids. He estimated that around two thirds of the family at the border were assisting bushwhackers and were quote, actively and heartily engaging in feeding, clothing and sustaining them. He proposed that families tied in the most infamous guerrillas were, sent to, were to be sent to Arkansas. He hoped that by sending them south, A would be cut off and force these guerrillas to move with their families away from the border. This plan enacted general order number 10, but then Quantrill's raid occurred. Ewing was suddenly in a difficult position. He knew that the people in Kansas demanded sufficient retribution for the atrocity they endured and wanted punishment to be doled out. So Ewing enacted general number order number 11. Citizens of the border counties were essentially evicted from their homes and had two weeks to relocate. Those who proved they were loyalty could stay in a military post or move to Kansas. This proves that the, uh, the effect of guerrilla combat resulted in misery for the common folk, folk. It also is yet another example of combating guerrilla warfare meant combating the ordinary system due to their aid of enemy guerrilla raiders. So the deeply rooted animosity, animosity between Kansas and Missouri since the bleeding Kansas era gave birth to a type of war that intensified during the Civil War. Guerrilla combat left pain and loss in its wake, especially prevalent at the border. Guerrilla warfare, warfare caused headaches for both the federal and conf Confederate governments, formed militaristic Jayhawkers, gave rise to Quantrill's Raiders, and stirred aggressive military action. In the end, this war to warfare delivered no victories, noble, no noble and grand battles like Gettysburg, and threw citizens in the middle of the conflict. The Civil War within the Civil War pitted neighbors, friends, and counties against each other, some in the name of the Union, other times for the Confederacy, but, but, but mostly for greed and plunder. These clashes left wounds that are not so easily healed. That is the people's war and that is why it matters. So that's basically my, uh, basically my uh, presentation. Awesome, thank you very much. Great work. Um, I will now, um, give some comments and raise some questions. We already have a couple questions that have come in, um, both in the chat and in the Q&A um, from Dr. Etchison and from, uh, um, from, from Jalen Madison in the chat. A couple for, for Kayvon, one for Jamie. I'm sure we'll have some for Dimitri as well as they start to roll in. So remember to post your questions if you have them and then we will, and again, thank the great work to all of you. These are great papers. Um, and you all stayed right on time, which is just an anomaly for academic historians, right? When they can't seem to stay on time. Um, so, um, so we have more in the, so I don't know if the panelists, if you can see the Q&A, you can start to form some of your answers. Um, Dr. Etcherson is, is posting things there, but um, so perhaps um, there's no other concept that was more contested during the Civil War era than freedom. I think Dr. Johnson kind of said this at the, in the welcoming remarks. Um, from differing ideas uh, held by Union Confederate soldiers to the actions of enslaved peoples, making their demands and conceptions of freedom quite clear, it was highly contested and contingent. Um, but it was not the first time nor the last when the idea of freedom would be contested. Um, indeed, if we go back nearly a decade prior to the outbreak of the Civil War, Frederick Douglass, the notable abolitionist, questioned the United States um, and its commitment to freedom when he asked his audience in his famous What to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech um, in 1852, quote, are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in the Declaration of Independence extended to us, meaning African-Americans? And of course, his answer was no, was suggesting that the Fourth of July was a holiday for white Americans only. But at the same time, he expressed hope and optimism for the future. I do not despair, he said, of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work to the downfall of slavery. Um, so in calling out America's commitment to freedom, but also expressing his profound hope and faith in the nation's ability to live up to it fully in time, 
he, D Douglas revealed the ways freedom was not only contested, but something that could change over time, and that was contingent. Um, and that is an idea um, that these three papers um, in this panel um, make us think so deeply about, I think. They all kind of get us to think about that um, kind of contested, contingent nature of freedom in this Civil War era. Um, and so these fabulous papers engage that idea in intriguing ways. Uh, they show the multiple ways that freedom was contested both at the time, but also in years since. Um, uh, as Jamie outlines in his paper that African-Americans sought to make freedom a reality within constraints of both the Union Army and former slave owners, uh, that freedom was quite literally contested in daily life and labor through labor contracts and so on. Or as Dimitri demonstrates in his study of guerrilla warfare, the contestation of freedom represented by battles such as Gettysburg um, had a much different meaning um, and implication and consequences at the local level of the Kansas-Missouri border. Um, and such contestation also has not disappeared in the years since the end of the Civil War. Um, as Kayvon draws out in her paper, historians have been debating the meaning of freedom um, for years, perhaps no more, nowhere more centrally than that question of what resulted or did not result from the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, so I'll kind of give a few more comments about each paper in depth and then raise a few questions and then we can kind of continue our discussion with the audience. Um, and so I'll go relatively um, in some sort of chronological order, not the order that they gave their papers. Uh, Dimitri's study of guerrilla warfare opens up important questions about what we think we know about the Civil War. He suggests, quote, guerrilla warfare had governmental, military, and social impacts that often glossed over during Civil War discourse, um, end quote. He shows us the bloody nature of this conflict and how in places perhaps far from the famous battlefields that maybe come to mind when we talk about the Civil War, that, um, that the Civil War had serious consequences for friends and families at the local level um, that were rooted in a deep past, as he mentions, the kind of bleeding Kansas campaigns of prior to the Civil War as well. Um, and so it made me think one question I'll pose later is also, well, how did that play out afterwards, right? Did these conflicts persist? Um, guerrilla warfare was also deadly, but not only for those who engaged in it, as Dimitri shows. Um, he says guerrilla warfare became what is commonly referred to as the people's war. Uh, even though we may think of the civil war in these grand terms, we really get a sense of this kind of daily nature of like what, how, what was the consequences for not just the soldiers, but for people living in these kind of contested terrains. But importantly, um, it meant the citizenry oftentimes suffered. Uh, but it also provided opportunities. And he, he mentions that for African-Americans, you know, he says, quote, um, for African-Americans, the Kansas militias and guerrillas meant new roles. Um, and he goes on to say, in Jim Lane's brigade, many had joined the ranks as teamsters, cooks, and soldiers. And stating that the, the guerrilla warfare was almost this precursor to kind of a model for what the Union Army could could become, you know, in terms of Lane's, Jim Lane's brigade. And so that's a kind of really interesting point to think about also, that we can also unpack kind of the bigger questions of the Civil War by thinking about how it plays out at that local level. Um, and he, as he mentions, Lane stated that the institution of slavery would not survive the march of the Union armies. Um, and of course, as Jamie shows, it did not. Um, African Americans looked to take advantage of the conditions that the Civil War had wrought by freeing themselves, or as W.E.B. Du Bois called it, they engaged in a general strike against the system of slavery and capitalism. Um, and as Jamie shows, African-Americans fled uh, to union lines in hopes of finding freedom, um, and, that, and they did in some cases, and this is where his paper gets really interesting and nuanced. Uh, as he writes, in Louisiana, military commanders, politicians, and the freedmen develop new labor practices to replace slavery in the midst of the Civil War. Um, but he says the results of their attempts uh, showed that their, you know, this attempt for freedmen to create their, freed peoples to create their own ideas of labor was largely unaltered after the Civil War. And so he tracks these policies through General Benjamin Butler in Louisiana, uh, the policies ranging from employing African-Americans on their former plantations not much of a change, um, but then slaves pressed the issue 
Um, as more African-Americans fled to union lines, Jamie shows Butler was forced to take on a new strategy, employing escaped slaves as contraband, um, which is a, a story, a much larger story of the Civil War, but we see the nitty gritty of it here in Louisiana. Um, other, policy, other union policies led to African-Americans be paying, being paid little, um, but little being paid, excuse me, but little else had actually changed. I mean, he talks about black codes and the strict labor contracts and you know, questions the kind of uh, extent to which uh, uh, freedom was really gained in some, in some ways. Um, and then he didn't mention this as much in the paper, but he also, or in his talk, excuse me, but in the paper, he talks about how African-Americans had their own ideas. Um, they saw land ownership as key to freedom um, but their hopes were dashed by white violence and the leniency of President Johnson's reconstruction policies. Um, so freedom again is uh, contingent and tenuous. And finally, that question of freedom and how it plays out, whether it's in the kind of locality of guerrilla warfare on the Missouri border, uh, if it's in the kind of uh, negotiation of labor contracts in Louisiana, leads us to Kayvon's uh, paper and her explanation of to the so-called great emancipator, uh, President Abraham Lincoln. And Kayvon paper provocatively, she asks, who freed the slaves? Um, and as she writes, the answer that most people would come up with is not all that surprising. Uh, President Lincoln, as she says, has come to be known as many things, one of those being the great emancipator. But she says, but this answer, according to Kayvon, is misleading, perhaps at best, and perhaps dangerous at worst. Um, Kay's paper interrogates how historians have written about the Emancipation Proclamation and its meaning in American history over time. So we hear, we, we zoom out over time here in, in Kayvon's paper to really think about then the battle of the Civil War is not over, right? The battles over its meaning and what the kind of different pieces of it actually meant, we continue to contest and debate in our present. And so in raising this question, Kayvon explores a much more complex and new, nuanced history of the Emancipation Proclamation than many of us maybe, you know, uh, thinking about it would have thought. Uh, she questions those who hold up Lincoln as the great emancipator by interrogating the scholarship um, that, and that shows his efforts to compensate former slave owners, his support for colonization plans, um, or more bluntly, she points to the historian Michael Vornberg's um, a uh, book on the Emancipation Proclamation saying that it didn't free a single slave. And as other scholars then go, as she points out, have a more generous view of Lincoln and the proclamation. And she kind of, and she, she sums up their points by saying the proclamation, although it's flawed, allowed for there to be official discussions on what to do about slavery or the legal questions, right, that, that Lincoln was praised for. But for, for African-Americans, on the other hand, as Kay points out, as Kayvon points out, the story was different. Indeed, she points out that the importance of Juneteenth, June 19th is the day many African-Americans recognize as the end of slavery, showing a kind of wrinkle to this question of who freed the slaves. Um, and after surveying the literature, she provides her own kind of view, at least in my reading, she says, quote, instead the proclamation can be viewed as the beginning of the end of slavery from a governmental standpoint, um, yet also recognizing, however, without the Emancipation Proclamation, the legal fight against slavery would not have begun. But she's also, excuse me, saying that it also is really limited because it doesn't actually take into account, um, in it, many of the historians haven't, to, you know, don't always take into account the experience of African-Americans and their, their view. Um, and she leaves us, um, with the point that the proclamation made great strides, but perhaps didn't always result in action. Um, and so I will leave that there and I'll ask a few questions for all of you. Um, you know, how do you see this idea of freedom being contested in your papers and your larger research on the Civil War era? How does it get reshaped in this kind of specific or redefined in the context you all write about? Um, I'll raise just one or two questions for each of you. And we have questions from Dr. Etchison and others as well. Um, and for Jamie, for example, um, you know, what do we think about this moment in light of the complicated nature of freedom? Were these, you know, were these laborers still enslaved? Were they slaves in just another guise, slaves in another name, so to speak? Or do we see uh, a kind of 
a different definition kind of going on at that moment in Louisiana. Um, the second question I'd ask you, Jamie, is did anything change with reconstruction? Um, I know, you know, you, you presented your paper, but I think your paper was bigger with the kind of Freedmen's Bureau. Yes, it fails by 1869, but were there moments when reconstruction provided more, what we might think of as more kind of free, free labor opportunities for African-Americans um, before we get to that, you know, as you point out this, the, the failure of the Freedmen's Bureau and others. Uh, for Dimitri, how did this uh, border war, uh, border war and guerrilla warfare um, pit families against one another? If you have any evidence of that, and how did they respond to it? Um, did uh, I'm also interested in thinking about how you see these battles in relationship to the larger war. And what I mean by that is, I'm struck by the ways that um, were these guerrilla battles kind of a, a model. For the for the larger battles, because you kind of suggest that Lane said, "Oh, you know, the Union Army could be the Army of Emancipation if it wanted to," and we see that on the ground in these guerrilla war in this guerrilla warfare. But did that translate in other ways, like the fighting or other things, to what we know about how the Civil War was fought? Um, and for Kayvon, um, you know, I'm struck kind of by two things, and I, I'm not gonna, I sort of have the same question as Dr. Etchison, but it, what do you think? Is there any one way to answer your question that you pose in the paper? Or is this whole kind of messy, complicated debate over it, you know, part of the real meaning of it, that it does give us this multiple meanings? Um, and then for African-Americans, what's at stake, right? You know, do you, can you speak a little bit, um, or, or excuse me, um, for African Americans, if you want to speak more about Juneteenth, that would be welcome. But also, um, you know, how do we see, you know, this kind of middle ground, as, as Dr. Etchison asks, um, given how entrenched slavery was, should we give Lincoln credit um, for even making some moves, you know, in the direction of emancipation? Um, and obviously, we have a bigger history there. So uh, I will leave it there and turn to the panelists. You can take up my questions. You can respond to anything I said. You can take up the questions that Dr. Etchison has put in the question and answer. Um, and I'm happy to read those. Um, the other for, so for Jamie, Dr. Etchison asks, it's clear that white Southerners could not imagine African-Americans as free. How did African-Americans themselves envision freedom? What did they think freedom meant? Uh, and for Dimitri, how does studying guerrilla, guerrilla warfare change or not change how we think about what the civil, how the Civil War was fought? Does it change what we think of as the nature of the Civil War? Um, so there's a lot of questions there, or things to kind of jump off of. Um, does any anyone want to jump in? Dimitri, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm going to, I think I'll be able to get your questions and uh, Dr. Etchison's questions answered in one queen sweep. So, um, it's interesting because I think that the the guerrilla combat was is a is almost like a case study within the case study of the Civil War because whatever what happened in the in uh, what would happen a year or so prior and in, in, in during that in the border wars uh, would no sooner reflect what would happen later on. Uh, Jim Wayne was discussing emancipation and fight and that considering the idea that this war was not about slavery long before any other governmental employee had it ever even stated that maybe this war wasn't about states rights uh, and that's kind of his take on it and I think that the uh, your question about combat it was very different uh, combat in the border was all about uh, it was like lightning raids in a way because they would uh, when people were sleeping or when there were no one was prepared that's when raids would occur it was very different than what we know as civil war battling in with complicated formations and intelligent generals. It was all about you either you came in, you uh, destroyed and killed as many people as you could. It didn't matter whether or not they were soldiers. Uh, it was just a one clean sweep. So I think that in the sense of the battle, um, the actual strategy is very different than what we know as the Civil War. However, the ideology was very advanced compared to where the nation as a whole was because they were talking about emancipation and freedom even before the Civil War had started. And that's a lot of, that was a big discourse in, uh, during Bleeding Kansas with uh, 
but also it also reflected it was almost like a hyper uh, it was almost like a hyper uh, reflection of how how divided the nation was as a whole because you mentioned how neighbors would be pitted i neighbors would be pitted on against each other i didn't really write this on the paper but i found documents where their own uh own family members would would fight each other and people within their own neighborhood would fight each other uh because of secessionist views that they believed maybe in missourian views while others would believe more in free soil views like the kansas jayhawkers and since they were so cl close in proximity to each other it it just it spiked it reflected the the divide of the nation at large but in a more of a intense tone because it was just a few miles within each other yeah, so I, I think that that was kind of an interesting thing with guerrilla warfare in the sense that it reflects, uh, it takes the ideologies of the Civil War and just perpetuates them uh, and magnifies them into a more severe case study of, of the Civil War itself. Great, thank you um, for that. And, um, and I, mean, I think that's a great kind of way to think about this whole period um, that we don't often think of. Um, Kayvon or Jamie, do you have any thoughts? And I should say also, you know, um, since we have, since you all stayed so nicely on time, um, if you have anything that you had in your paper or other research that you'd also like to share, um, we've got, you know, at least 20 minutes here left in the, in the session. So, you know, that's a thing that you can keep in the back of your mind. Cause I know from reading your papers, you know, the in-depth research you all did, if there's other things you'd like to kind of share with everyone, that's a, that's something to do as well. Uh, yeah, I can go next. Uh, so to answer Dr. Edgerton's question about like uh, what freedom meant, a uh, big part of it that I mentioned for a second in my paper is just have gaining economic autonomy. I actually, uh, when she asked that question, I went back into the notes from our class really quickly because something clicked in my mind. And there was uh, one man named, uh, I believe Garrison Frazier, that uh, talked about the idea of being like released from the yoke of bonding and being able to create their own well-being. So uh, this also kind of plays into the idea of 40 acres and a mule because uh, this comes from General Sherman who redistributed uh, plots of land kind of similar to what the uh, Freedmen's Bureau did. And uh, this idea spread throughout the South. So this idea of being able to create your own economic autonomy was a big part of freedom. And uh, another part that I didn't really go into uh, because it doesn't necessarily deal with labor is the chance of them getting the vote. During the, uh, uh, the words uh, escaping me right now, but when they were talking about uh, uh, the constitution of 1864, uh, there was talk about granting partial suffrage to uh, black residents in Louisiana. Uh, that didn't happen then. Uh, it would eventually happen with the pass of the fifth, the passage of the fifteenth amendment, but for other reasons, going into like the last the last part of the nineteenth century, that ended up not many people, black people, were able to vote. So a big part of freedom was gaining that economic autonomy to where they could uh, create their own land and create their own well being away from any white planters that just wanted to control them. And uh, as for uh, your questions that you were asking. Uh, you kind of talked about like the gray area if they're still like treated if they're still slaves or if they're free people uh if you talk about like how they were treated uh throughout uh reconstruction they were still treated as slaves i mean everyone was still uh very racist and wanted to re-implement the society the the slave society uh during one point in my uh presentation i switched from talking about uh, referring to people as slaves and switch to referring to them as free people. Sorry, my phone was ringing. Something that was really interesting was that uh, during uh, or whenever Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it didn't apply to certain parts of Louisiana because it had been recaptured by the Union. So uh, the people that were in this area the, were still technically counted as slaves. So that's just like a very, so that was also made it very interesting to study this, but they were still treated as slaves uh, throughout reconstruction and I'm um, sure for years after that. And as for uh, reconstruction, uh, I didn't go too far into the research because eventually uh, reconstruction just ends up kind of 
just dropping off and not really happening or not really doing anything significant uh, or does something significant. But and this is another part of my presentation uh, that I had to cut out because I would have talked about it for 10 minutes straight because I find it so interesting. But uh, when the Freedmen's Bureau would uh, uh, acquire land and then redistribute it to uh, free people, uh, one of the types of communities that African-Americans began living in were home colonies. And there were uh, four of these in Louisiana and three of them almost immediately failed just because of like financial reasons and all that. But uh, one that survived was called the Ross Colony. And it was the plantation of a man named uh, Pierre Ross who left the country because he ended up being the uh, Confederate ambassador to Spain. So uh, he leaves the country and then a bunch of free people start living on this property. And at the height of it, there were 720 free people living there. Uh, and what was really interesting about the home colonies was they were also like shelters for people who were elderly or sick uh, or uh, some form of disabled. So, you know, being blind, uh, having, uh, not having all your limbs, stuff like that, that keeps you from being able to do work. So up to like 600 of the people, 600 of the 720 people uh, still uh, or fell into that category. So uh, even though uh, most of the population couldn't really work that well, they still were able to return a profit. So there was a really good chance that this could go on and become like a major force for uh, free people in Louisiana. But uh, when Andrew Johnson uh, started handing out pardons to uh, Confederate officials, uh, Pierre Ross was able to get one uh, expedited because of how high he was, because of his connections in the government. So he came back and uh, had to just like turn out all these people just like onto the streets essentially uh, with no means or anything. Uh, all the people, the 600 people or so who fell into the disabled, sick and elderly category went to a Freedman hospital, but everyone else was just kind of turned out. So I was using that like as another example of like the potential for something good for free people in the South gets stripped away again uh, by people at all levels, including even the federal level. So uh, yeah, I think that kind of answers your question at least. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Kayvon, I wanna give you a chance to respond either to some of the questions I raised or to the question that uh, Dr. Etchison raised directly for you. And then just as a heads up for all of you, we also have another question. Um, and then I know Jalen in the chat, Kay Kayvon, I don't know if you've seen that, if you wanna uh, respond to, her, to that question, um, to their question about how this fits in with your other research, you, you feel welcome to do that and then we'll, we, we can turn after Kayvon gets her chance. Uh, we have another question for all of you um, to think about how do we reconcile all these different notions or de contested definitions of freedom in all your papers, but leave that on the back burner and Kayvon, I'll we'll give you the floor here. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Dr. Etchison's question for me. Um, about how entrenched slavery was in the United States and whether or not Abraham Lincoln should be given credit considering that. I think the answer to that question depends on the path you take to answering that question. If you choose to look, focus more on the time period and um, the normalities that were in place back then, such as white supremacy and racism and how it was just a part of American, of the American um, nation back then, then you could see it as, you could view that question as, okay, Lincoln did as much as he could. He did what he could do in the times. But for me, um, knowing that there were people alive at this time, also members of the Republican party, very close people with Abraham Lincoln who were adamant abolitionists such as Ashley, who took steps despite the normalities back then. I think it kind of, um, it, it causes you to look at Abraham Lincoln kind of sideways with um, how much he actually did because you're looking at, okay, well, these are people that were alive with you and they did this, but you were only able to do this. Um, and I think that um, for me personally, I take, um, I think you raised a question about this as well, as far as like African-Americans and their view. Um, personally, I take my viewpoint of this is more similar to Lamont Bennett Jr., who is not a historian, but he has written the book on Abraham Lincoln titled Forced into Glory, which I am reading currently for my research paper. 
and he aims to shift the gaze to the abolitionists who pushed Lincoln to do what he did and less to Lincoln who was just the one who had the power to sign his name at the end of the document. So I aim to give um, recognition to the people who really were fighting for Lincoln to change his views or do something about slavery despite Lincoln's personal views about African-Americans and slavery in the United States. Um, I did read Jalen's question in the chat about how this differs from my current research. Um, this paper, this historiographical paper, um, focused more on after the Emancipation Proclamation and the failure of it, or the success, um, depending on which historian you side with. My current research is more focused on prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. I am starting back when Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer in Illinois and looking at his court cases and the people he represented all the way up until the Emancipation Proclamation and examining how um, his policies um, influenced the Emancipation Proclamation as well as his views on African-Americans. And to do this, I've been reading his inaugurational speech um, from his first administration, his debates with Stephen Douglas, uh, particularly the one in Ottawa, Illinois, I've been um, once again looking at his court cases. In particular, I've been looking at one where he represented a slave owner who was suing a man for harboring some of his slaves. And I'm looking at um, the uh, Abraham Lincoln collection, which is a large collection of sources gathered um, of Abraham Lincoln's papers, his correspondence, and all of his other writings. And with that one, I'm looking at um, one particular source I have is. Abraham Lincoln met with some, what he considered to be prominent African-Americans in the White House and discussed his plans of colonization. And um, basically it wasn't a question about it. He was basically just informing them that this was going to happen, basically whether they liked it or not. And um, he didn't really give them room to have an opinion about it. And this really helps to view, okay, this was right before the Emancipation Proclamation. What changed in the year or two that led up to him deciding to free the slaves. And this really um, causes one to look at Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation about whether it was for the African-Americans or whether it was strictly just to better the union and end the war. Um, as far as Juneteenth goes, um, I think it's interesting that growing up, a lot of African-Americans don't know the background of Juneteenth. We just know that that is what we celebrate and that in order to find out the true background, you have to dig into it yourself. But despite that, we all still collectively agree as a community that that is the day that African-Americans finally saw freedom when the word finally traveled to the South, not to the North, but all the way to the South in Texas, that they were indeed free and how long it took after the Emancipation Proclamation for this to occur. Great, thank you. I think you've all kind of answered these questions in nice ways and thinking, really complexly about these questions, right? You know, whether it's Lincoln, whether it's this question of labor, um, uh, you know, Jamie, as you were talking to the question that, and I'll, I'll pose a question, but I'll, I'll really get us to, to Dr. Etchison's question for all of you here, was also thinking about gender and how did work play out differently for black women and black men, you know, in this kind of post, in this place in Louisiana um, is something to think about. Um, and with Dimitri as well, you know, thinking about these kind of, um, you know, precursor and the ways that the the it was that the guerrilla warfare looked differently, right? But also similar, you know, we have it's 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 not one or the other, right? In many of these cases, um, and so uh, we have the other question to all of you. And if anyone else wants to ask questions, feel free. We still have ten minutes. Um, she she, uh, she asked, do you think there was a way to reconcile all the different contested definitions of freedom possessed by African-Americans, white Southerners and Northerners, or was the Civil War um, doomed to fail in remaking the Union as truly the land of the free, right? Was there just too many competing interests and ideas, right, at work to where that that wouldn't, you know, couldn't be entirely reconciled. So um, that's something um, anyone want to take up that big question, right? It's kind of a Really big question there. Dimitri, did you raise your hand there? You want to jump in? Yeah, I think it's interesting uh, in a way because if you take uh, 
even on the border of the Kansas Missouri border today, you can still see that the, there's extreme tension and general dislike between the two sides, between people that still live in Missouri and people that live in Kansas today. And I think that, uh, and it's even more so, most of the, most of the, we still see the wounds of the Civil War still present in today's society, especially with Confederate statues being uh, taken down, things like that. But I think that the ideologies of, of at least when with guerrilla combat and the, my study is still very prevalent today. If you go down to Western, uh, West Missouri or down, go down near Lawrence, Kansas, those people still don't like each other very much. And uh, yeah, I think that it reflects a lot of, a lot of how the Civil War, it was very difficult to find, it was no way you could fully repair the, a union and when, when, there's a, when there's so many competing interests in our country. And I think that's kind of part of what makes uni the United States the way they are in a way, because of how diverse and how, how opinionated people can be. But uh, as far as freedom, I, I don't know if guerrilla combat, at least for me, uh, really led to freedom in a way or promoted freedom ideals. Uh, I think that if there's anyone who wrote a paper uh, it was definitely the one with um, with Abraham Lincoln's and his decisions because that reflects the freedom, in my opinion, the most. Um, but I still think that with, even within uh, guerrilla combat, I still think that there was a sense of freedom with the people that joined uh, brigades and things like that who had their own opinions uh, and had their own thoughts and processes. And they, they believed in their own version of freedom. They believed that when they were fighting, when they were raiding Lawrence or when they were raiding uh, Western Missouri that they thought that they were they were trying to free themselves from the other states ideals and their concepts and their secessionist ideals or their abolition abolitionist ideals. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yes, I think, you know, they you, that you hit that point really that I was thinking about that they were fighting right for their ideas of freedom, which looked very different from what we might think of, you know, when we say when we use that word. But I think Kayvon, you had I saw your hand raising. Did you want to jump in? Okay. I kind of agree. I think that um, from the viewpoint of today's society, that we have seen that the Civil War was kind of doomed to um, end in high racial racial tensions still being pre present in the United States. We saw that with the Black Codes. And we saw that with redlining in Chicago and um, the Red Summer as well. And we see that still today with the lasting um, impact that the Confederacy has on America. We see it still with um, people carrying around the Confederate flag versus the Black Lives Matter movement and the, the two colliding at times. And um, we see it still with the protest um, for not only African American lives, but Asian American lives and all um, BIPOC in the country and how this country still seems to be rooted in racial tensions between the, um, the, the white people of this country who are seen um, as being the majority and the minorities of this country. So I think that despite the war, um, eventually ending on the idea that it was intended to free slavery. It did not begin that way. And because of that beginning, it is hard to be able to end the war, ending racial relations, even though that was not the fight the entire time. Great, thank you. Yes, I think those battles, you know, we can see continuing, um, and Jamie will get to you. And I think, you know, it, all of your papers come to this point, I think that we could think of is the ways the, ideals versus the reality and how it played out and what that you know how that then limits right what what goes on in the future right there's this contingent moment again right so jamie go ahead <laughs> uh i think that uh it's interesting uh because on paper technically by the passage of the 13th amendment uh people who were slaves were now freed so i think that's why it was labeled as freedom but kind of like you were saying, like uh, what people say it is versus what it actually is. Uh, in reality, they weren't really free due to uh, kind of refer back to some of the stuff that I talked about in my paper. But uh, for the Civil War being uh, like doomed to fail, I think that it was uh, necessary to 
go about making the changes because I think that people in the South, especially the people that I looked at in Louisiana, weren't just willing to give up the system that they uh, had lived with and who a lot of people who had uh, like achieved great, amount of, great amounts of like wealth in it. So I don't think those people were going to be, I don't think it was going to be easy to take away the system that had worked so well for them. Uh, but the Civil War needed to happen or else there wouldn't have been any major change. And I don't think that it was uh, 100% expected that uh, attitudes towards uh, free people or former slaves were going to change immediately. So even though it seems like a lot, uh, there was a lot of bad stuff that just continued after the Civil War, it still wasn't necessary to bring about any important changes for uh, all people in the South, for all the African Americans in the South. Great. Um, well, we're getting very close to the end of our time. I don't see any other questions from our um, audience. Um, this is, yes, as, as Dr. Esterson says to all of you, this is great work. Um, these are fascinating papers. Um, my final question, which um, you don't have to answer because we only have three minutes left <laughs> is, you know, I was thinking about this kind of a, uh, about what Dr. Johnson was talking about at the, at the welcome remarks on kind of a lot of papers that are and things that are dealing with how we remember things. How do we present the history? So like what's at stake? What's the kind of, um, you know, what's at stake in the way we remember the Emancipation Proclamation? Does it matter, you know, if we remember it in one way or the other? Does it matter if we think about labor, right? How do uh, labor during the, the, in Louisiana during the Civil War, does, does it, you know, does it really matter if we change that interpretation or with guerrilla warfare, right? Does it really tell us something different, you know? You know, so what are the kind of stakes involved with all of this? If you want to comment in our last two minutes, that's another big question. But I think that's in the background of everything that you all are talking about. Um, and sometimes we just assume it's important, but we don't always name it, right? And so I think you all probably know, you all know what you want to say. So if you want to, Dimitri, you had your hand up. So if you want to jump in, we have a couple extra minutes. And, you know, as those of you who have had me in class know, like I tend to go up to the end of the time, so. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I think that I think that we, we kind of the guerrilla warfare has been kind of forgotten in a way, at least as, from the general populace as something that most people don't even really recognize or acknowledge unless you lived in along the border, because if you live in the Missouri or Kansas border, you definitely know about Quantrill's Raiders and all that. Um, but I think that it does reflect how as a na as a nation overall, we've kind of been scarred by the conflict. Uh, there's wounds sometimes, wounds sometimes don't fully heal. And I think that we've seen uh, the border as the perfect example of, we move on in a way, but we haven't fully moved on. There's still those ideas and those strong beliefs that simmer in our country. And I think that from a national aspect with the Emancipation Proclamation or even the labor unions and things like that, these conversations still happen today. Um, Maybe not at the same extent. Obviously, it's not going to be the same way, but we still have these talks. And with labor unions uh, today, uh, should they should they go into you know bargaining agreements, things like that? And I think that uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation as well, how do we really we remembered it as Abraham Lincoln's uh, kind of thing? But there was a big uh, it was a community effort. So yeah, I think that at least from my perspective, it's kind of gotten forgotten. At least guerrilla warfare. But yeah, great. Well, thank you all for great papers and great um, responses to the questions. These are fabulous. Um, you know, I don't have a reaction mark, so uh, congrats and great work. Um, thank you to the audience for coming and for the great questions.